it's okay to fail. Personally, I'm at my third or fourth business now. The first two failed. But I kept it, I was, I was, I did keep a job though along, along the way. But I invested in some companies with friends or to support friends. They didn't work. It's okay. You learn. And think of the founder of Uber, right? It took him like eight or nine years and four failed companies to actually get to where he got. And because we have this, and it's probably linked also to our culture and education system that is structured in a very rigid way about you pass or you fail. But the reality is that business is about learning. And when you fail, you learn something, right? And also the, who you surround yourself with, etc. And at the end of the day, even when you fail, those 200 whatever million or 50 million have gone somewhere, have created jobs, have fed people. It's the law of nature, right? You know that because you, you're in the space when we call the food chain, yeah? It's the same in society, in business-wise. And I think this is something we need to demystify quickly. That's my point. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm so, going to let, no, I no, can't no, do it, because no, no, really. i got to let them no, no, respond no. to there's the other a, question. There's one thing that was not mentioned, which I think was the confusion is, and that deals that equity gives the equity investor part of the ownership of the company, and that is where the confusion is. Okay. So, let's come back to, and again, we're in our first AYA, African Youth Agripreneur Forum. There's some learning, I think, that will come out of all of this that we can tackle within Enable going forward. And one of those is the different types of capital that are in the value chain of capital. We had during the pitch discussion, I just want to touch on this for a little while, the whole idea of everyone pitching for equity. Some people were pitching for debt, but they probably should have been pitching for equity. And we asked, how many have been to business school? And we had maybe 20 people, and I think we had one or two. There's a lot of learning that comes with understanding the financial part of your business. And I think within the Enable program, we'll be able to help with that. The valuation of your company. If you're giving away some equity, most of us say, but it's all mine. I did the work. It's my company. So, how do you relax a bit and say, okay, I'll give away 30%. How do you know whether it should be 20, 30, 40, 45? Some people say never give away controlling interest, which is 51 or 50.1. So again, we're, we're throwing a lot at you, but this is the, the process that you want to go through so that you're not like the colleagues at the business school who may have a probably unrealistic perception of the risk and put their money in because everybody says agriculture is the future, but don't know how to, to manage that risk and are not aware of the ecosystem or the value chain. So thank you for the comment, uh, but I'm just trying, my, my program director is here, so I'm trying to manage time. Please. Okay, quickly, I would, uh, you go for a loan when you have established cash flows and they are certain, otherwise, Stay away. You go for equity when it's venture stage or early stage where your cash flows are no known, you are straight is iterating your business model, and you're not very sure that you've integrated along the whole value chain and all of that. And it's also important as part of the financing in the agri, uh, uh, agri business space. That's why I said look for credible of takers. When they give you a contract, you can now take that contract, maybe to the banks, and they will be certain that when you deliver the produce to the quality that the off-taker likes, they, you will be paid, and their loan will also be paid. Stealing of ideas, you need to have NDA in place, and particularly for those who are into the ICT space, if you have an idea that is unique after you have piloted it and you know it works, Patented before you take it to investors. What does NDA stand for? Uh, Non-disclosure agreement with the potential investor before you disclose your information. If you talk about uh, things that 
require collateral, you have to go for financing that does not require collateral. And most of the times, the equity financing piece is important. And one of the key things that break equity deals is always about value system. You invest to expand the business, and the promoter wants to buy a V8 Toyota car. That's not what the money is meant for. You invest, you want to take the risk, then valuation becomes an issue. You haven't even sold anything, and you probably say the company is worth 50 million. I think it shows that you actually don't understand your market and the opportunity that you are dealing with. You also talked about the difficulties, and I think it goes back to the debate that we had yesterday. We need to be very crisp to segment the value chain. In the agri space, we have infrastructure, we have input, we have logistics, we have processing, and we have markets. Apart from infrastructure, all the other segments are commercially viable on their own. What sort of heavy lifting or subsidy do you require and for what reason? I do not expect you to build your own road to your farm or extend electricity to your farm or water for you to juice your, uh, uh, do, uh, 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 juice processing. So we need to be clear and engage the partners in this space like uh, 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 the lady said, we also do advocacy. We are deeply involved with the governments and uh, to make sure that if policies are stifling, then we work with them to do, uh, do so. But I will just urge that it's easier for an import substitution play than an export play. Export, you will need certification, phytosanitary uh, uh, approvals, and all of that. I'm not saying don't do it if you can get it. But if we can do import substitution, the market is local, and you can influence the people in there. Take rice, take poultry, take sugar, and all of that. So that's just a, a word of uh, whatever to all those who are into the business. Can, go ahead. You have a related comment. That yeah, just, just a comment. Um, yeah, for the NDA, yes, it, it's necessary. Uh, but to be frankly honest, if you go into a, um, a business being scared of somebody stealing your idea, you better not even start, seriously. Because what really makes the difference is not an idea. It's execution, right? It's what you have, who you have, how you do it. There are so many factors that actually make an idea real. An idea is nothing, right? So, and, and this also needs to be, sharp, uh, I mean, pushed away, this thing of, oh, that was my idea. I mean, I had the idea of Uber before Uber, <laughs> right? And so what? Yeah? So that was the point. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to get to three points. The first one, uh, again, to stealing the idea. What, what we did basically at the Feed My Foundation is uh, we have um, a contract when we have coaches, uh, they sign a contract, and in the contract they sign, they kind of like uh, engage in not uh, stealing any idea from any person they are mentoring. Uh, those are kind of like practical things that I, I feel like uh, we should put in place. And uh, when we are going to incubators, I think you need to look at those things if they have in place uh, such agreement with their mentoring, their mentors, and so on and so forth. And uh, how many um, services, uh, the person talking about she has no money, zero money, yeah, you can still do something to people uh, in offices in town. That's simple. You just go and pick the juices, and then we vouch for, for him and then he pays like one week later. And then today the guy is doing his own Jewish unit. And then the second example I can give you is one guy who was in a, in a similar situation. Uh, we helped him, he spent like a week or two. Uh, you know, in Cote d'Ivoire, we have those people who have been doing grilled chicken on the roadside, like kebab. 
and then what the guy did was we let him spend like two weeks with one guy who was doing the kebab stuff and then uh, later on he, he we get him into one of our network uh, and he will go and then you know get some um, some chicken on credits and then he has started having his own kebab uh, stuff and then eventually um, for those uh, the guy who has been talking about money, losing money after two years, I mean, that's very dangerous. It's very, very bad. It's very bad because um, that's the wrong signal. And, you know, whenever I hear people uh, talk about such situation, I'm kind of scared for the future of entrepreneurship. Because that's the very reason entrepreneurship is failing in most African countries. Because if I'm a young people, and then you are telling me that it, one guy who has money put like five millions, and then he lost, or he loses all of it, I'm not going to get into entrepreneurship, man. I'm going to go and find a job. And in some of the um, countries we've been to, we have like young entrepreneurs and that come back to the ecosystem they train them, they give them money uh, as a seed fund, and then they don't have access to market. When you are a lady, they will tell you, okay, come on, uh, can you come on Sunday to my, uh, to my place so that we discuss the contract? I say, bullshit. Because if I'm coming to you, what then? And then, or if you are the guy, they will ask you, okay, can you give me this, or bribing, or corruption? So really, those are some of the problems. Again, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think the IPO, you talked about it yesterday as well for the IPO stuff, uh, industrial protection. Yeah, thanks. We have one more round. We had right here was first. Um, I'll go way in the back, second. There's a lot in the front. Third, this young lady. Um, I'll take the two of you, fourth and fifth. Okay, sixth and seventh. Now, we are now standing between ourselves and the tea break. So can we continue? Is that okay? 15 minutes? Okay, so it will cut. We're going to do this in three and four. So if you can do the three quickly, we'll do it. And you can speak on the, in the break if, if we miss you. All right, uh, thank you very much. My own question borders on the issue of advocacy and the bridge that I seem to be seeing between incubators and uh, dovetailing to the Enable program and the real issue on the field. Now, if I'm a farmer, if I'm a young farmer and I'm producing maize and I have challenge with market access, then all I need is a solid contract to supply. So my question is, why is part of this advocacy thing not going towards bridging the gap between the young agripreneurs and the established structured market? For me, as an example, Apex Commodities gave me a lot of leverage um, in engaging some of these tier one um, companies to be able to get valid contracts, and it unlocks capital. So if that can unlock customer credit for me, if that can unlock even working capital credit from Ubuntu Capital or the other or private equity capital for short-term transactions which can dovetail into my cash flow, then my need for, for, for financial support reduces. So my question is, I think the area of advocacy in supporting young people needs to be really, really taken care of. I'm not sure if that is in all the programs, but that is my area of concern. Thank you. One and then this young lady two. So go ahead, number two. Merci beaucoup. Does anybody in the front need uh, headphones or will we? Go ahead, allez-y. Uh, merci beaucoup. Mon inquiétude de revenir à dire que les banques donc on ne prête pas confiance. Est-ce que c'est à nous la jeunesse de les prêter confiance? La, resti la réticence des banques est que Il va donc appuyer ce qui ont déjà des moyens. Mais je pense qu'il devait accompagner les start-up, donc nous accompagner dans les premiers temps, puisque 
Si donc il ne nous fait pas cette confiance-là, je pense que le lendemain, il serait peut-être difficile. On est de l'Afrique de l'Est. Imaginez une banque donc, qui verrait M. Dolazam, qui verrait peut-être M. Lujugiro venir auprès de leur banque. Ce serait un honneur. Donc je pense qu'il doit y avoir un partenariat certain qui nous fasse confiance dans nos petits pas, dans les premiers pas, alors que l'on grandisse ensemble, sinon donc je vois que ce partenariat douteux, douteux, je pense que vraiment ce ne serait pas super. La bureaucratie, les garanties, donc tout ça, ça doit être mesuré. Et j'ai beaucoup aimé M. Mathieu quand il a dit qu'il doit y avoir donc un contrat avec le mentorat, le coaching, à ce que l'on nous élève et que l'on aille ensemble. Donc on a, on a besoin d'être enlevé, élevé par les banques dans le premier temps pour que l'on grandisse ensemble et que le partenariat continue. C'était ça ma préoccupation. Merci beaucoup. So yours was more of a comment than a question. Um, and I, I don't know if, if everyone caught that, but as I understood you, what he was saying is that the bank is really not interested in taking a lot of risk. You have to have a partner, someone who's going to stand by you and help you grow that business. But it's, well, this is the question perhaps for UBA. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll put you in the UBA hat. Is the bank in the business? I don't think they are. In working, you know, we've talked, our other colleagues who are impact financiers have talked about the whole technical assistance and support. Banks typically give you money, take their interest, and they're done. But I'd like to get your point, because he was saying that we actually should have that kind of support, the mentoring, the support along the way to develop. Hello? Okay. Thank you. So, um, yes, I'm not, I wasn't here wearing the UBA hat, but I think I can answer this question. So, UBA actually is the number one um, bank lender to agriculture in Nigeria. So, UBA is very involved in supporting um, small agribusinesses. And I think that um, I would like to commend the administration for finally getting Development Bank of Nigeria um, starting, because I know UBA is doing a lot of work with them to support more um, small agribusinesses. Yes, you're right, many financial institutions would, do not, um, are not attracted by the high risk in agriculture, but I feel like the government has a, a big role to play in guaranteeing some of those risks and stepping in to partner with some of the more established banks in supporting um, our small agribusinesses. Yeah. So in, in that regard, UBA is willing to provide. He was saying, again, that it's a collective effort from the bank. You were talking about what the government is doing. Okay, so just as a point, most of the time, you're, the bank is going to look for an external guarantor. Some of the banks, Equity Bank on the other part of the continent is, is one, UBA seems to be one, are starting to recognize that they should provide a little more support, post-lending support. But if, in general, you're looking for that from your bank, um, you may not be satisfied. So you should just go into the bank understanding what banks do and what they will not do. Okay, go ahead. Just to add a comment to uh, what she said, the banking structure is different from private equity. Private equity, you take risk, you make money, and then uh, the entrepreneur that you've backed makes money. The banking industry is your deposits that you've given to them and you expect that when you wake up and want to go and withdraw your money, the money should be available. So for them to take it and take risk positions without mitigation, it's a no-no. And I think that uh, without being unfair to the bankers, I think maybe just because banking has been very traditional and an imported thing into most uh, African countries by the colonial master, we are used to armchair banking. Instead of being innovative in trying to structure transactions to uh, mitigate the risks that we see in businesses. And also our governments are not helping. Why would I uh, forego the uh, opportunity to invest in Ghana government bonds and probably get 20% and I'll be taking a risk on uh, Joe Block? 
So all of these factors are very important. It's just business, it's your deposits, they promised you interest and certainty of your deposits and they need to make sure that they don't lose that money. And of course, there are other opportunities that are less risky and attractive than uh, having you and then uh, go the long haul of a couple of years and not being certain that you will succeed. With the uh, individual youth in agribusiness, or is there any possibility uh, to partner with youth organizations that have potential candidates for the program uh, to tackle uh, that issue of youth access to finance? If yes, what are the requirements for that specific partnership? Uh, and then my second question also goes to Tony Elumelu. I'm also interested in knowing the performance of agribusiness enterprises uh, which have received funds from your, pro from your program. Do they continue to outperform uh, like three years after receiving the funds? Uh, my last question, maybe it goes to everyone from the panel. From your experiences and the expertise, uh, do our African youth in agribusiness really need entrepreneurship skills for their ventures to succeed? Thank you very much. I wanted to take uh, one more question, the gentleman who's got the mic on already. Bonjour, je suis Ben Aziz Konate de la Côte d'Ivoire. Euh, moi, je n'ai pas une question, mais j'aimerais plutôt apporter quelque chose en ce qui concerne la recherche de financement et le capital zéro. Et donc, euh, moi, je viens de la fondation de la FADET du docteur Samuel Marté et j'ai commencé au capital zéro. Aujourd'hui, l'entreprise grandit, mais on ne peut avoir le financement, on ne peut pas avoir de financement si on n'arrive pas à rendre un dollar en un dollar cinquante ou un dollar en deux dollars. Donc, euh, nous n'allons pas attendre d'avoir euh, 10 000 dollars, 5 000 dollars pour commencer notre business. Il y a plein de personnes qui ont des idées, qui aujourd'hui ont des idées qui peuvent changer l'Afrique. Mais aujourd'hui, je peux poser une question à la dame de la Fondation Antonio Limelou. Euh, lorsque vous faites le concours, est-ce que quelque particularité accordez-vous à ceux qui ont déjà démarré leur business et ceux qui ont des idées, juste des idées Quelle est la différence que vous accordez dans le critère de choix? Let's, let me just explain the question, fini. though. Tu as fini ou tu n'as pas fini? Je pas fini. Ça, c'est une longue question, hein? <laughs> non, ce n'est pas une question. En fait, c'est pour apporter quelque clair. chose aux différents jeunes africains qui sont ici. Moi, au départ, on m'a fait un business plan de 2 millions de francs CFA pour commencer l'agriculture. Je suis le chef d'entreprise de volaille d'or en Côte d'Ivoire qui fait la production et la distribution au consommateur final de produits agricoles. Et donc, euh, ce business plan de 2 millions, on l'a ramené à 60 000 francs. Et ces 60 000 francs-là, on peut considérer ça comme un capital zéro parce que ça a été démarré de façon périodique, petit à petit. Je n'avais même pas les 60 000 au départ quand j'ai commencé. Et aujourd'hui, l'entreprise fait 6 à 10 millions de chiffres d'affaires par mois. J'emploie huit personnes en Côte d'Ivoire et je n'ai jamais fait de demande d'emploi. Et c'est aujourd'hui, maintenant, que cette entreprise peut être euh, en besoin de financement pour s'accroître. Mais si au départ, j'avais eu ces 2 millions de francs CFA, je ne pense pas que je serais là. C'est pour vous, merci. So, so that was mobilize uh, the universe around them with support. I think the thing that I would underscore for zero capital and you did it without a lot of support. But there's more support now. So part of the exercise is identifying where you can get support from to move your business to the point where now you do have income. But I, the testimony that I took was that you can start. He's living proof amongst us uh, without having lots of capital. So we've got six minutes. There's one gentleman who wants to ask a question, then I'm going to turn it over to the panel, and then I think we're going to close. Go ahead, ask your question, and then Sam, you can come after his last question. Merci. Moi, je m'appelle uh, Chao Donat, je viens du Bénin. En fait, quand on parle de l'agro-business, la, de chez moi, moi, on dit ça en trois parties. On, on essaie d'aller vers les patterns techniques et financiers, 
qui paye nos outils pour aller vers les producteurs. Mais on a constaté qu'on est appelé à disparaître. Notre, modèle, notre, modèle, euh, notre business model n'est pas viable. Donc, qu'est-ce qu'on est en train de réfléchir On réfléchit à un modèle où on pourra utiliser les publicités dans nos applications pour rendre notre truc plus rentable. Maintenant, je veux poser la question au docteur Samuel. Comment est-ce que je peux partir de zéro avec ça Puisque, par exemple, on est en train de travailler sur une application où la ressource humaine n'est même pas disponible au Bénin. Où il faut forcément faire un tour à l'étranger. Comment partir de zéro dans ce cas-là ben, C'est vraiment compliqué. Merci. Okay, so he is, again, Sam is getting a lot of questions about the zero capital. But the way that I took your question, you're really providing extension services to farmers. And he's saying, but it's very difficult because they don't have a lot of money. I'm providing expertise um, to support their business. And my business is, is deemed not viable by many. So how can I use your zero capital premise to grow my business? Thanks a lot for all those interesting questions, guys. Um, well, first of all, what I want to tell you guys is uh, uh, even when you get a funding, uh, you got into trouble. Because most of the time, uh, there's no unlimited funding, ever. Uh, so there's always selections. And what we found out was like there, are, there were a lot of young people coming to us, though they had funding. But the main problem with funding in Africa today based on our foundation and statistics that we are collecting. Because last year we trained like 3,500 people in Côte d'Ivoire. This year we are training 65,000. Hello. This year we are training 65,000 youth in Côte d'Ivoire. And then in all of Africa we are training like 200,000 youth. So one of the problems we are having right now is like even the people who got the capital, the funding, we have that lag problem because the young the youth will come and then they'll tell him that okay your business plan or whatever is good i'm gonna give you uh like tony elumelu or uh, five thousand or ten thousand but by the time he's gonna that money you know inflation or all over because i tell you receive the money or the funding like or 12 months later. And then nobody will be there kind of like adjust the inflation or whatever problem he has. I think that is one of the key problems we are having right now. And then uh, for some of your problems, that goes back to the business model. You need to be innovative. And then I think you've started, you know, getting to some of the solution like uh, uh, advertising. But what we teach in our workshops is that you have free resources. And Michael was talking about abundance of resources. You have free resources. Today, uh, we had a startup that we link up with uh, um, organizations in MIT that provide like uh, free uh, resources. And then they can bring interns from M MIT to your company in Africa to help you. So we have abundance of resources that you can get for free to kind of like develop your application. And then with all, uh, what I want to tell you is that um, for me, the crucial problems regarding uh, institutional framework block road is tax. And then we have started what we call Initiative 535. The initiative 535, what we are saying is that we want to we start advocating with the uh, African Union to bring all African countries to give five years free tax for any youth, any African youth that is setting company and then that is 35 years and below. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, we've run out of time basically, but I'd like to give each panelist one minute to touch on a question. There were some questions asked by the young lady uh, or a closing remark. Uh, obviously, there's a lot that we could talk about. Hopefully, we'll continue in the break. OK. I'm going to touch on the issue of entrepreneurship. I don't know what that word means, 
But what I want is somebody who is prepared to roll up their sleeves and do the heavy lifting. Entrepreneurship is very difficult for me to. Somebody who roll up their sleeves and do the uh, uh, heavy lifting and the dirty work. And also, most of the times, the companies that have failed, particularly in the agri space, is uh, absentee farmer. You are an absentee farmer, you have the money, and you think you like the title CEO, and therefore you not get on the tractor. And another of bad scale. You want to be big quickly. And bad scale in for those who succeeded or failed. And we have what we call the four A's framework. Those who have succeeded were able to demonstrate the advantage of their innovation or their product. Anything at all that you want to do, when you want to buy something, you will ask yourself, what is the advantage to you? If there's no advantage, whether you are into seed, you are in extension services, what is the advantage to the person who has to buy? After that, they will ask, can I afford it? Affordability is a key issue. And most of the times in agri space, we're talking about for you to be profitable, it's about volume rather than price. But you come and you want to price your way, and therefore you cannot compete with imports. So affordability is one uh, 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 A. And the third one is uh, awareness. You probably have the product, but you haven't created the awareness and all of that. And the last A is access. You probably have an agrib, whatever, but you are based in uh, Lagos instead of you being in Kaduna, close to the farmers. You want to run your business from the city. So access to is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mamadou? Uh, thank you. You know, I've been, um, I've been listening and talking a bit. Uh, uh, I have to say, for me, it's been a extremely informative session. Um, informative for what and why? You know, when you, you know, it's always kind of a, um, I don't want to portray that image of the banker in his ivory tower, right? But um, it's, it's good to get back to basics, right? Um, and get back to basics, you know, I mean, that basic question about equity and debt, right, which you know, one would think everyone knows, but which actually maybe 1% of the population knows. And somehow, I'm mean, gonna start with that point that I've learned. And somehow it's a problem. It's a problem for our society, which links to something we've been advocating with Africa 2.0 and Ubuntu Capital, which is we need to teach entrepreneurship from secondary school. And this needs to happen now. Why? Because all of us here, or our children, will either work for someone or have people working for them. And knowing the basics of how a company works sometimes is more important than knowing what they teach us about Greek antiquity. And, um, and it's just, you know, this conversation once again reminds me how much we should insist when we start, when we talk about advocacy. And, and, and it's even more important to put that in secondary school because our political leaders don't get crap about what it means, right? They made political careers. So even when you go to advocate to them, you're talking Chinese. And that's a problem. They can't relate. Many of them, at least. Right? Except those who've been in the private sector and who haven't made politics as a career. But it's still 5%. So this is one key, at least for me, um, and as a takeaway and something that we need to push together, not just us, as uh, Ubuntu Capital, but also all of, all of people here. The second point, you know, it is also linked to that, is the question of access to market. And um, that point about how do we get contracts? 
right? I would say it's a, it's a good and a bad approach. It's a good one, it's a, let's say why it's bad, is that don't even figure out how you get them, go and get them, right? Uh, the, the very fundamental thing about the entrepreneur, it de I think is de-intellectualizing a problem, is actually act on it, right? Now, why is it a good thing? Is because it also reminds when we speak about advocacy, um, and those problems are links, and that's why it's important to understand the very core about ecosystem. When I was at GE, um, we were basically bidding on a deal. I'm not going to go into detail of that. Um, Multi-billion dollar deal. And I was heading the investment and project finance team for Africa. So what we did, we create a, um, a, form, a guarantee system where we would back our suppliers for them to get the working capital to actually operate. Why? Because a lot of those multinationals work on a 90 day, 80, 60, I don't know. And this is important when you talk also about advocacy, how we can leverage on larger corporations and governments to make it a point in terms of taking the responsibility to support and enhance their own supply chain. And this also links to something that we're advocating for um, yeah, together you. with the head of, uh, I mean, the UN Women, uh, Uli Matassar, who's in charge of West and Central Africa, is that for government contracts, 30% of the procurement should go to women and youth. Mamadi. Last point, <laughs> if you don't mind, last one. Um, the, and, and to finish, ultimately, you know, my, my, what I'm sharing, what I would like to share with you is um, a personal experience as a former corporate guy that became an entrepreneur, but who's been spending so many years working with some entrepreneurs, including some of the most successful in Africa, like Aliko Dangote, who've seen them and I'll help them, but on the other side as a, either advisor or banker, is it's a tough, tough game, right? I had respect for them when I was in the corporate world, but now that I'm an entrepreneur, I understand their journey, and trust me, it's more than respect. They are heroes. And you should always, always, when you have the guts to start something and go this, through this extremely difficult journey to give you a tap on the back and say, I'm doing what 1% of the global population is doing. And out of the 1%, Maybe 5% will make it, but at least I'm building a legacy. Thank you. So much, you get the last word. She gets the last word. Thank you. Um, I'll just touch on a few questions that were directed at the Tony El Meli Foundation um, and wrap it up with my closing statement. Um, I think that there's more of a role for mentoring in establishing the relationships between the small entrepreneurs and the more established, more established companies than advocacy. Because at the end of the day, we cannot force a big company to choose to work or partner with a small company. And I think that's where mentoring is very important. Because if you expose the heads of these bigger companies to what the smaller um, enterprises are going through their ideas, then you see a more organic partnership take place. You see a more a less forced um, partnership. And so we have examples. So I'm not just saying this because it sounds good on paper, but we've seen it happen in real life through our foundation. Um, some of our mentors had huge agribusinesses um, across the continent. And so we pair them with the smaller um, um, agricultural enterprises. And so we don't force them to do business with these small entrepreneurs, but then we see that there's a natural progression in their mentoring. So when they start off, we ask, answering their questions, introducing them to different you see that they, we can work with youth groups like yours in producing research material. So we do do annual reports. So we have a report in agriculture, we have one in entrepreneurship in general, and we're very interested in partners like you um, who can support us in writing those kind of um, impact, impactful research um, papers. So we, we can take this conversation offline and see how we can partner um, with you. Um, finally, I really want to be brief because I understand tea break is next. Um, we've seen that 
our agriculture entrepreneurs are doing very well over the three years. And it's not because of the financing we've given them. It's not because of the um, network. It's really because of the training. So a lot of them did not know about how to promote their goods, how to market their services, how to raise awareness. And so that's why when my colleague mentioned awareness in one of his four A's, I, I, really, um, I really understood where he was coming from. Because on our training program, you also learn how to put your good out there. It's not enough to work the hardest, to produce the most innovative service if it's not in the marketplace, if you don't know how to communicate it to the market, if you don't know how to address your target audience, then your business is not going to scale. And so I think that's the one thing our agriculture entrepreneurs have taken from our program and grown their own businesses off of that support. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, to know more about the foundation, the TonyElimeliFoundation.org is our website. Um, we invite partners like yourself, we invite investors like yourself, and we hope to take the conversation beyond here. Thank you. <laughs> a big round of applause to this Yo. panel. I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I want to say a big thank you. You, you, one minute? All right. <laughs> no, what, what I want to tell you guys is that the way to go forward is zero capital. Just for one reason. Just one reason. In a Greek, you only control 1% of the business. You don't control 99% of the business. Aziz didn't tell you about his story, his whole, his whole story. One day he lost all his poultry. And one day you're going to wake up and then they will tell you weather problem, blah, blah, you lost all your harvest. One day you wake up, they will tell you, yeah, there is that a virus for your poultry. You lose everything. And that's where you're going to start thinking about zero capital. Because those guys, at that time, don't give you another money again. They don't give you another fund again. And believe me, zero capital is the way to go. Thank you. That, that was a commercial. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, all our panelists. I think this has been a very good one, and I knew it was going to take long, and they proved me right. Really, you cannot exhaust friends, fools, family that give you money and all that, but we've gone further, we've gone beyond. It shows that entrepreneurship is maturing in Africa. Thank you, please. You may leave the stage. We appreciate you. For the Tony Elumelu entrepreneurs, please meet Somachi. I'm sure you'd love to take a picture with her. I have, please don't leave the hall. Don't leave the hall. I have some announcements, very critical. We have um, a few people that need to go to the room we used for, press, um, for the press conference yesterday. Patrice Sewade, Martin Stimela of Botswana, um, Emime of Burundi, Ernest or Ernest Etem of Cameroon, Gloria Adu of Ghana, Fidel Arunze of Kenya, Zila Mua of Kenya, Sheila Eram of Kenya, Alexander from Rwanda, Tendai of Zimbabwe. Can you can you pay attention, please? Ike Chuku of Nigeria, Mitu Lovett of Nigeria, Mercy Wakawa of Nigeria. Mamadou Tore, of course, um, Godfrey Nwindare of Ghana, Anne Samake of Ghana, Beauty Samake or Mamake, Botswana, Beauty spoke yesterday, and Awakaba of Senegal. So please go into the room we used for the press conference yesterday. Another announcement is that the African Agribusiness Incubators Network, AIM, that I represent and that many of you came on their auspices, is inviting all agripreneurs to join its membership network. So AIM has a range of business support services ranging from business development to access to finance. Please see Fred at the AIM post in front of the conference hall for more information. Many of you have not yet visited the exhibition stand. Please do so when you're going for lunch. We're going to come back from tea break in the next uh, 15 minutes. 
There are some lost and found items that we make here. There is a one in particular, the one, the brown jotter. If you left it somewhere, it's been brought here for you. Please pick it up. 